Graham. Happy Wednesday, everybody. My name is Chris Smith. I work here at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, and I will be your host, as I am most Wednesdays, for the Lunchtime Discovery Series. Uh, this program is brought to you, though, by the folks at the Office of Environmental Education within the Department of Environmental Quality, working together with us here at the museum to bring you a great show every single week where we take the opportunity, take our lunch break, to meet some interesting people who are doing interesting work out there, like really smart people who know a whole lot about a whole lot of things, uh, and in many ways are working to make a difference in science, nature, the environment, education, art, and more. Uh, today's guest uh, is one that is fairly familiar to us here at the Lunchtime Discovery Series. John Gerwin is Curator of Ornithology here with us at the Museum of Natural Sciences. Uh, but for some reason, I don't know why, we brought the bird guy in to talk about bees and wasps. Actually, I know why. It's because John is a fantastic naturalist, a student of all things in nature, uh, and still definitely knows more than me about bees and wasps. Hey, John. Hey, Chris. Thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks everyone for coming out. I'm going to go ahead and move over to the uh, dreaded PowerPoint. Um, get started. <laughs> the dreaded PowerPoint. Okay. <laughs> there Listen, we go. I think it's going to have some of your pictures of uh, of insects and more in it. So I think this is going to be a good one. Thank you. Yeah. So <clears throat> today I'm going to talk about uh, something that anyone can do, which is uh, looking at the pollinators in your yard. During, especially during the pandemic, I spent more time looking uh, in my gardens. They're not very big gardens and documenting all sorts of things in the yard. It was pretty exciting. So that's what I wanted to share with people, just how much biodiversity is right here in a little Piedmont urban setting. Along those lines, I'm also going to have, I have a colleague of mine speaking at the end. It's Gabriella. And she'll be talking about a new project that you can participate in. It's going to—it's—it's it's a combination of a scientists as well as citizen scientists doing a bee atlas. And she'll explain what that is and how you can be involved at the end. So uh, a little quote that I like to start with. And those of us that are naturalists that are trying to be aware of, of all the little ecological connections out there, bees are obviously a pretty important one. Here's a series of bees, and um, actually there's a couple of them in there that are not bees, and so I will also show you some images of things that, that look like a bee or a wasp, but are not. And I'll just let you know that uh, I use simple tech. Uh, I will use my camera, some uh, phone camera, but mostly a point and shoot. They're not perfect images, but it's uh, to me, it's how we see things. Uh, so it's a, uh, <clears throat> I like to show people what to me is a little bit more like reality, not the perfect not geotype photo. And at the end, I can show you some uh, websites, a few links to resources that I use, some books that I've used, a list of plants. If you've got your phone handy, you can photograph the screen. Um, and the one thing I will not talk about uh, today are honeybees. They are, there's a lot of information about honeybees out on online or with other groups that specialize that are beekeepers. And if you want to learn about the, the honeybee, you can, uh, do it through that route. I'll be talking more about some of our other native bees and a few non-native bees um, in my yard. So this is what one of my little garden plots looks like. Uh, it's not very big right there. It's um, it's about 15 feet by eight feet wide out in the front yard next to my neighbor's driveway. But you can see I can pack in a lot of plants in a small space. Uh, in the backyard, there's another little patch on the left side in the corner. Um, and then, then that's actually a, a close-up of that corner. So again, that's about 10 by 10, and it's not a big area, but you can pack in a lot of plants into these small areas, and the pollinators will find it. Most of my stuff in the yard are native plants, but there's some non-natives, and they provide nectar and pollen. And here up the street are a couple of places where my neighbors just grow some plants right along the sidewalk. So when I'm walking the dog, I always carry my camera and I check out the pollinators that are on these different plants. Lantana is a good one, Cosmos. They're attractive to different pollinators and they do provide some um, some nectar and pollen. Uh, a quick look at where the, the bees and wasps fall out in terms of our uh, family tree. You can see they're more recently uh, derived or evolved group. So the red circle is the Hymenoptera. You can see they, they seem to you know, show up about the Permian, uh, 
in a geological sense. There's about you know, over 150,000 species. And of course, the females are the, are the fertile ones. They, they're the caste system in Hymenoptera. So there's drones, workers, the queen. Many of them are predators, especially wasps. And we'll talk about that. And then many consume pollen and nectar. Uh, there are many uh, parasite relationships within the, the Hymenoptera that both to other groups like other arthropods, but also within Hymenoptera, there are wasps that parasitize other wasps. So we'll, we'll show some examples of those as well. Um, so that's, um, you know, it's a circle, it's a cycle. Uh, uh, I, I'm growing plants to attract pollinators, but you attract everything and there are, there are predators out there. So here's a, a robber fly eating one of my bumblebees in my backyard. And then there's uh, one of Gabriella's pictures of a lynx spider eating uh, one of her bees. Um, that's, how, that's how it is, that's the system. We're gonna look at the whole system, but then, you know, it comes around to the, uh, the hymenopter here is eating a caterpillar and so, um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about paper wasp and uh, just how you might manage, how I manage paper wasp in my yard. It's a little bit of an artificial setting. And again, they're parasite to parasite. So, you know, we'll talk a little bit about that too with a few more slides. Um, I have a little bit more to say about wasps and bees. That said, I'm gonna get started with, with a few bee, bee shots. Um, the bees evolved from, from wasps, that's the latest data. And here's a, another family tree. So up at the top there in the gray, that's the, the group of bees. And down below, you can see all the different wasp groups. And so I have photos of all, you know, all those things like the digger, wasps, the scoliated wasps, the velvet ants, um, paper and potter wasps, cuckoo wasps. So those are those are early early offshoots in Hymenoptera. And then the, the bee group evolved from, from wasps. That's what the genetic data show us. Uh, here, I'm going to start with one that's uh, perhaps the more uh, one of the more common ones in my yard. There are three that are pretty common. I'll show those three. The one is the brown belted bumblebee. And so in general, the bumblebees are underground nesters. They're usually in burrows. My, bel my brown belted bumblebees uh, will use my nest box or even in uh, one year they used my shed. But um, the adults are consuming nectar pollen. There's about... Uh, over 20,000 species worldwide. We have close to 500 species of bees in North Carolina. Um, and again, most of these are ground nesting. Here's a close up of a few uh, in, uh, milkweed flowers in my yard. And just know that the names of, of these things can, or in this case, the brown belt, some of the features can are variable. Sometimes it's hard to tell which species you're dealing with. I use iNaturalist. I also use a colleague, Gabrielle and I have a colleague at NC State. She checks on my photos. Uh, the ones on the left, you can see there's a little bit of rust tinge on the on the lower abdomen there. On this next slide, it should show a little bit more. Yeah, you can see there's definitely more of a brown belt on those bees coming out of my nest box in my yard. So um, <clears throat> that, they're the case where it's easier to, to know. Uh, that's what they mean by brown belted. Um, that was an, an, just a close up on a hot day. And, July a couple of years ago. The nest on the inside, in case you're wondering, this is what uh, what they do, the brown belted anyway, this is how they build their little nest in the boxes, they chew up vegetation and cram it all in and uh, away they go. This is the common Eastern bumblebee. Um, and it is uh, fairly common in my yard. Again, these things are all uh, big pollinators for our, our native plants and, and non-natives too. They, they got around. Um, <clears throat> doing their job both with the, you know, consuming and spreading pollen, they also consume nectar. There's a couple of different shots. One is the, the dorsal shot. And then uh, another one is the American bumblebee. This one has, I think you can see, it's got a lot more yellow on the abdomen. There's variation, the one on the upper right, uh, obviously is, is, is a bit different, but, um, but still got the, the very yellow abdomen. And then there's there's other species, again, in the area. Sometimes they're tough to tell, but um, there are people who who will help with identification on iNaturalist and NC State. <clears throat> Here's one I learned this year. Gabrielle and I were out at uh, Weymouth Woods and she was uh, showing me Southeastern bumblebee and a uh, blueberry bee rather. And then I came home and a few days later, I took photos of these bees in my front yard that the on the uh, left there. and um, both iNaturalist and our colleague at NC State, that's Elsa Youngstead, they looked at the photos and said, yep, that's a Southeast blueberry bee. I was the first one in my yard this year. I, they've probably been there all this time and I just didn't know it. 
Uh, the one on the right is a, is a decent shot from down at the Weymouth Woods on a blueberry. But the one on in the middle there is on an azalea, obviously. But um, get, getting something it needed. There are minor and digger bees around. They are um, <clears throat> similar to bumblebees. Uh, that You see the hair pattern. I haven't actually found them in my yard yet. Our, my neighbors have found some in their yard. They're not, they're not rare, lots of species, um, but they, and they are they are here. This is, um, there are mason bees around. Now this one that um, Elsa identified for me. So there are native and non-native mason bees. And you know, this is one that people like to put boxes out for. And there's a lot of uh, debate about whether that's a good thing or not. So they're cavity nesters, it's a solitary. They, they can be in like loose colonies, but they're nesting in their own little burrow. Um, Here's a non-native one, and this is kind of a, a, a funny story. Like this showed, I saw this this spring in my carport, and it would not sit still, but it kept going to that little hole in the mortar of our brick in our carport. But I finally took a picture of it in flight. I put it on a naturalist, and it said that it was a Taurus mason bee. So I said, I asked Elsa, does, what does this look like? And she wrote back and said, it's a Taurus mason bee, but it's not native. It's just showed up in North Carolina about 20 years ago. So these are things that, again, this is the reason to say use a program like iNaturalist or to have a bee atlas is to document these things. And then, uh, we're, we're, you know, we're ha we have to deal with the different native species. We don't know, or non-native, we don't know their, their, what their impact will be on, on the native fauna, but at least documenting them to get started is, is an important part of what we do. Um, so moving on, here's a little sweat bee, little green, called pure green sweat bee. I like I like seeing them out there. There's a, there's a couple of species, but this is the one I see most frequently. There are furrow bees in the area. Um, I put this as a one of two species. Sometimes you have to dissect these things to know which species, and I do not do that. So we know it's either poets or ligated furrow bee. I'm happy to know it's a furrow bee, and to have them around, they're pretty common on my on my summer blooms. Uh, here's a, a longhorn bee, and you can look at it and go, well, it sure looks like a furrow bee, but there are, again, there are a lot of similarities to some of these different groups. And after a while, uh, using the different resources, you learn to tell them apart. There's just a close-up of the guys in my yard. And, you know, just looking at things like where the, the hair on the on the leg is here, on like this one on the left, these bees gather pollen. That's, that's one way that they gather pollen. And I'll show you a different way here coming up. So with the carpenter um, mimic leaf cutter bee, there's a couple of forms. The one on the right is, is all black. The one on the left you can see has a little bit of some yellow tufts. I see that variation in my yard, um, but they're all carpenter mimic leaf cutter bees. They're in the uh, group of megachylidae, they call them. So here's some more, again, the ones that are a little bit fuzzy. And then this is what I was saying, how they gather pollen differently. So you see that orange, the orange on the abdomen. When I first saw this, I thought, wow, what kind of species is that? I did not realize until I did some digging and looking and reading that that's how these bees store their pollen, not on their legs, but under their abdomen. <clears throat> There's another bee, black, that's in my yard. I don't have, I didn't include it today, but it was getting the same orangey yellow pollen, but it was pushing it onto its legs. And so that made it a, a different group It put it in the longhorn bee group. And that's just a different leaf cutter bee, just to show you a different shape and, a, and different stripes on it. You might notice that a lot of these plants are a mint. Uh, it's a mountain mint and it's quite the attractor for pollinators. That's, I mean, it's just amazing. Uh, what that plant does to these bees and wasps and other groups that are, I see beetles out there and flies, all these things are going after this mint. <clears throat> so the carpenter bee, that's, a, that's, that's you know, it's a lot of hate. Um, many people know the carpenter bee, it's a larger bee and it's a carpenter, it's, it's a carpenter because it is well known for digging holes in our wood structures. We have our maybe a wooden porch, uh, the wood siding on your house, you might have a bench out in the yard and these guys Burrow hole, the female uses those holes. That's where she lays an egg and uh, raises the, has the larva bee inside. Uh, easy to tell by the real shiny abdomen here. You can see the one on the right captures that. And then um, 
So the, the carpenter bee is one that Elsa uh, was doing some research on a few years ago, and also uh, Gabriella was helping her. And so um, that's uh, when um, her daughter here, her daughters have been coming out and helping me. Uh, actually, ban we ban birds also in the URI, and Gabriella's a bird bander too. And so I have a project, the URI, during the pandemic, we had her daughters out helping a lot, but her older one got really interested in the carpenter bees, and she learned uh, a lot about them, and she also learned early on that you can tell the male and the female apart and so i'll show you how how that looks in a second so, um, so here's a female it's a black face and then when you look at a male it's got this yellow patch right up front and uh the fun thing was that um, what eliana her daughter learned to do was um you can you can pick these up because the males do not sting it's only the females that sting and so she thought that was really neat to be able to pick up the bee, but also to show people. So unsuspecting visitors would come to the banding station or be out in the field with them. And she would invite them along and say, hey, would you like to see a carpenter bee? And uh, then go to pick one up. And of course, everybody thought she was going to get stung. And and uh, she would slyly explain that now she was kind of the bee whisperer and she could she could handle bees and pick them up. And because these people didn't know that the male didn't sting. And it was very comical. We had that uh, a few times at the banding station. And I have to say, it, still, it took me over a year to get comfortable with picking up a, a male carpenter bee, even though I saw her do it a dozen times. Um, but I finally did. I did, I, I you know, I did ask one uh, once, and I and here's a carpenter bee getting pollen, two different carpenter bees getting pollen. I said, so what about these bees that get yellow pollen? Can you confuse them? And sheepishly, she said, yeah, there's a couple of times where I did get stung thinking that a female was a male because of the of the pollen but mostly it's worked out and it's, it's a, a fun thing for her to do and then part of the study that they were doing was uh the cycle the sort of the cycle of life with the carpenter bee and that has to do with the tiger bee fly so it's another to me this looks like one of your bees or wasps that are out there but, but this is the fly and it parasitizes the larvae of the carpenter bees some other bees in the in the yard are these charcoal bee flies, and in this case, these species parasitize the larvae of mason bees. So they're laying their eggs on the larvae of their preferred bee host, and then the fly egg hatches, and it eats its way to adulthood by feeding on the larva of the bee. And then here are a couple more, to me, what are bee-like mimics. The two on the right, they're both... Uh, they are the, um, do I have the name? Yeah, the clearwing, snowberry. All right. So there's a snowberry clearwing moth. And to me, they look like bumblebees. People think of them as like a hummingbird moth. And, and they're kind of like that too. But they, uh, to me, look like a bumble or a carpenter bee, especially the one on the right. The one on the left is an ironweed clearwing moth. It looks like a wasp to me. When I first photographed it, I thought it was some cool wasp. And then it turned out, turned out to be this ironweed clearwing moth. So they're out in the yard as well. Um, other things that look like the bees out there, uh, there's a little hoverfly. It kind of looks like a little sweat bee. Um, and here's another one, the transverse banded flower fly, <clears throat> bee-like to me. And then here's yet another flower fly. This one, this one is pretty common in the yard, especially in the late summer. And then a bigger one that I that I caught one time in a jar. I, th I thought it was a wasp, but it turns out it's a, a Virginia flower fly. It sure looks like a yellow jacket to me. But that's the point. It's mimicking, mimicking these things. And so that you know take us into wasps and hornets. Um, so we'll look at some some of each. I got you know photos of the different like digger wasps and sand wasps. Some of them are above ground nesters, like the paper wasp that you know, and hornets, and then some are below ground. And I'll start with the European hornet. This is not native by its name. You could gather that. The related yellow jacket, they really pack a wallop. This is one that sent me to the hospital years ago. This is why I carry an EpiPen. That's quite the venom that they have. Um, here's one that I found uh, in my house not long ago, just a couple months ago, disconcertingly, <laughs> that it got inside. But um, there, it's a colorful one. You can see on the right, that was one that we caught in a net. We had to uh, cut it out. And uh, so I took a chance to take the photo. It, it is a pretty colorful one. And I was able to, to take a close-up of the stinger. So there's a, there's a nice shot of the stinger sting. Um, these things, like I said, they really have a very uh, potent um, venom. And then there are yellow jackets. And you know the thing about the, the wasps, the yellow jackets, for example, is when they sting, 
they can repeatedly sting. Whereas with the bees, the bee individual, the female can sting you once and then the stinger comes out and that's it. Uh, but with yellow jacket, the, the danger to us, somebody like me, is that if, if, a, if one yellow jacket stings me, it, it drops a chemical, a pheromone, and the other bees see it. They, they can sense it and they all come after that signal and start stinging you so you can have many, many stings. And that's the, the problem with going into anaphylaxis. One, one wasp that looks like an ant, and it's called the, the uh, velvet ant, but it's not an ant. It's a wingless female wasp. They parasitize bumblebees. So she, the, the one there on the, uh, the, that I'm showing on the left and the right, she is walking around in that straw, dead grass, and she's looking for a bee nest. And she will go inside legs, and her larvae will consume the bee larvae to, to grow into adulthood. And I trap one there in the middle just to uh, get a photograph. Because when you see them in the wild, they are not; they will not sit still. That, that female wasp, that velvet ant, she is just walking, 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 walking. Uh, I, I never see them stop. Um, there are small. There are small. Um, Wasps. Then, I mean, not 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 very big, three quarters of an inch maybe. On the other end are cicada killers. They're pretty big. They're harmless. And then I joke, they're harmless unless you're a cicada. Uh, but that's her job. Her job is to, the females to go find a cicada, catch it, and she will uh, sting it and just paralyze it. Doesn't kill it. And then she will drag it back or fly it back to her burrow, stuff it inside, lay an egg, and that's what her young will feed on. Here's one that was in my yard a few years ago, and I followed her across the yard. She, I mean, she must have gone 20 feet, went up into one of my potted plants, didn't like that view, came back down, went over to our oak tree, climbed up the oak tree, got about 12 feet up, and then she launched, and she flew down the street and around the bend. And last I saw her, she was about four houses away, curved around the bend, so she, she had her burrow somewhere down there. It was pretty neat to to watch her do what what she what she did and how she was able to get high enough to where she had uh, felt like she had enough <clears throat> um, height above ground to launch and be able to have a good flight back to her burrow. Some uh, smallish and medium-sized wasps that we see out there are the potter wasps. If adults are on nectar, they build a mud nest. Uh, uh, often it's in a pot shape where they get their name and potter from their, their name using mud. They're somewhat related to mud daubers, different families, but they behave similarly. And like some of the others, they're hunting for caterpillars that they paralyze and bring a caterpillar back to their little mud nest, put the caterpillar inside, lay one egg, and that's how the caterpillar uh, grows up, feeds on the uh, caterpillar larvae. So here's a couple of thread waisted wasps that are in the yard. The one on the left got the little orange band is the common thread waist. The one on the right now is something like gold marked thread waisted. Uh, the one on the right I find much more commonly in my yard. So here's a couple of shots of that one. The one on the right is that one with the orange. I don't see it as frequently um, as the one on the on the left. And some other wa uh, potter wasp species. They, um, best I can tell, as, as of just few months ago, they didn't, nobody had a common name for them, so I didn't bother with the scientific name. But you go on iNaturalist, they give you the scientific name, but nobody's come up with a common name yet. There are a lot of species out there, a lot of species of different wasps. Here's yet another potter wasp that I couldn't find a common name for. I'm sure somebody has one out there, but um, they're, they're just, they're fun to have out there, fun to identify at least, uh, even with the uh, scientific name. <clears throat> and I, I have my account on iNaturalist, so I document all my yard stuff grown up to be quite a list. This one, I do know what it is. It has a common name, the yellow-legged mud dauber wasp, and this is the only one I've seen. And I got a little excited when I saw it at the end of our street. It was, we have a little creek under the street, and it, uh, there she flew in and was getting mud to build her nest. And I knew I didn't have much time, so I grabbed the camera, and I was kind of shaking. So it's not quite in focus, but it was really exciting to see it. My first one, it's the only one I've seen. And uh, then she took off, and I could not follow her. I'm sure she was building her nest on you know on the side of somebody's house but it's a beautiful beautiful little wasp um and then there are these things called cuckoo wasps and some of them are pretty pretty dramatic looking that one on the upper left um <clears throat> our colleague uh, missy mcgaw just retired from the wildlife resources commission and she's a photographer so we borrowed some of her photos here um the cuckoo wasp 
they're a parasite of a parasite, essentially. They are laying their eggs on the larvae of the thread-waisted wasp. And you may recall the thread-waisted wasp is laying its eggs on the larvae of a moth or a caterpillar. And so, you know, you've got like a double paralysis, par paralyzing and parasitizing going on. The cuckoo wasp larva will hatch out and will eat both the caterpillar and the wasp larvae. So it's, it's a, like a double hamburger there. Um, and then um, just to, you know, reiterate that there are even more parasite levels or maybe even a fourth level people are still learning as they do wasp studies they keep finding new things that there are different levels of parasitism a wasp on a wasp on a wasp there's a parasite of the parasite so anyway there's still a lot we're learning about these things so um here's the bald-faced hornet and most people are familiar with it because of the nest they make there the big papery nest um i think of it, it's more of a wasp than a, it's more related to then kind of a hornet that's that name gets used in different ways but um but it's a beautiful one although that one on the left was in my carport last year i wasn't too thrilled about that but it uh, was probably a scouting female and it moved on but at least i got a good photo before she kept going so i'll move into these uh, other ones these other groups that are in my yard the sandpaper digger and scoliad wasp by scoliad that's just the genus of the wasp and people use that as the general name or the family of Scoliidae. The adults are feeding on nectar. The females are laying eggs on different kinds of larvae. Some are caterpillars, some are beetle larvae. And they do this, you know, it's the same cycle. And again, some are laying eggs on other wasps or bee larvae. So as I said, it's, it's kind of messy out there. The katydid wasp, it's, uh, by its name, you can probably gather. It's, she lays her eggs on a katydid and the larvae grow up, feed on a katydid, paralyzed katydid. I don't see this one very often in my yard, and it's always really skittish, the individuals. I've only seen a few times, been hard to get a photograph. They see me coming, they see me focusing, and they'll take off. So, And they're always on the move or on the flower buds. The great black digger wasp, I see them, I see them probably second most common in my yard. The golden rain digger wasp is, um, I don't see it very often either, a little more frequently than the Katie did, not as much as the others, but it's it's a it's a handsome one. And then the one I see the most frequently, probably the most dramatic one, the great golden digger wasp. And then we'll move over to paper wasps. So I, I said earlier I'd say a little bit about um, you know managing paper wasps. These these guys are so, are efficient predators. And they're super efficient. I'm sure you're familiar with all these little little nests that you find in your carport or under the soffit of your house. And, and there lies the problem. We've created a lot of habitat for paper wasps and their population levels are inflated because of that. And then we're tr when we try to grow caterpillars uh, like monarchs, then we, we now are feeding wasps is what we're doing. So here was a 2020 paper that came out saying, you know, all these paper wasps were just in our urban gardens are just an ecological trap. So that just means some intervention. So I do intervene. If the paper wasps are too near my house, I take them out. Um, I'll let them do their nesting if they're down by the street or further back in the backyard, but not too close because near my house is where all my milkweed are. And that's where my monarch butterflies hang out. I also cover up my milkweed when I have monarch caterpillars on. I have netting that I put over it. it still lets the light in the and the... Um, plant still grows and the larvae can still feed on them but it keeps the um it keeps the wasp out but sometimes i do have to just kill some of the wasps they are so efficient they just they will just clean out all your caterpillars and this is the most common one in my in my yard the metric paper wasp but i also see the guinea paper a wasp the uh, dark paper wasp so um anyway you can decide how you want to handle your caterpillars and your paper wasp but it's something to know they are really really efficient predators. Um, there is a, a sand wasp. It's a stink bug hunter. So you can imagine that's what it does. That's lays its eggs on the grub of a of a stink bug, a larvae of a stink bug. And then that's how the wasp larvae will uh, sur survive. And then uh, here's one that's, um, it's a spider wasp. Now it's called the tarantula hawk wasp. But in fact, in, in 2005, there was a publication saying that we actually don't know what it lays its eggs on. So it's believed to be a trapdoor spider. And there's one there. They're somewhat related to tarantula in there. And I've seen them in our neighborhood a couple of times, uh, the um, the trapdoor spider that is, and then the, the uh, hawk wasp is around. But it's interesting that just less than 20 years ago, somebody's saying, we don't know what this thing is feeding on, it, feeding its young. We don't know how it's raising its young. 
Um, it's probably been discovered by now. I haven't looked lately, but I just think it's a fun thing to tell young people that there's a lot of things out there that we're still trying to figure out basic natural history stuff about the animals that live right around us. Here's another related one, another spider uh, wasp, a hawk wasp. And this one, we know what it feeds on. It feeds on the rabid wolf spider. So there's one on the up in the middle. She's digging around in the leaf litter looking for one of these. That, that's one on our street there. I got one, a rabid wolf spider, and she's got all her babies on the back. But that wasp will uh, paralyze the spider and take it back, lay its egg on it, and off they go. In the Scoliad group, this one, this is this is really the bird connection. Uh, wondering why the bird guys here. This one's a feather-legged uh, Scoliad wasp. You can tell by the, the feet sticking, the legs on it, things sticking up. Yeah, it looks kind of feathery. This is a Scoliad, Noble Scoliad, uh, Blue Wing Scoliad, and the Double Banded Scoliad. So these, uh, and here she is hunting for a beetle larvae. These feed on the uh, larvae, larvae of beetles and Coleoptera. So there she is rooting around my yard. I followed her around for 30 minutes and I didn't see her find anything, but that's how it is. So there's at least four species right there in my little garden plots. And then um, this one was really, when I found this, it was down actually in our Uwari site where, where Gabrielle and I work and to do both bird and pollinator stuff. And when I found this, it was after doing some bird work. I had a few hours and I went out looking for pollinators and I was so excited. I'd never seen anything like it. And I, I was so happy to get a photo in focus and iNaturalist knew right away what it was called a sculptured resin bee and it's not native. So that was a disappointment to find out it was a newly introduced, accidentally introduced bee from, I believe from Asia. Southeast Asia, and so we don't know what the impacts might be to our native fauna, but it was just another reminder that it's it's challenging out there. Um, so, you know, with that, there's uh, the mountain men on the left. There's three species of, of bees there. There's the scolia at the bottom, and at the top of the leaf cutter in the middle is a, is a honeybee. On the right is a bee that showed up, and I naturally isn't sure what it is, and I haven't asked Elsa yet, but it's interesting that the two, the two things it thought it might be are very rare in North Carolina. And so um, it, it may be a Scalia, uh, but it didn't, the, the iNaturalist didn't think so. And so I just, I haven't been able to figure out what it is yet. Um, we will figure it out, but it's just interesting to know that maybe in my backyard, here's something that shows up that's for at least for North Carolina, only a few records, if what iNaturalist thinks it is, is really what it is. But, you know, I'll get that over to the Bee Atlas folks at some point and they're the experts they can maybe uh, tell us what it is but that's the reason for doing a bee atlas so um, here are some resources again i use iNaturalist a lot i also use the related app seek uh, you can read about that bug guide you can use there are publications on iNaturalist that have to do with bees and wasp identification nc state has some publications uh on on bee identification that's um uh, Elsa has done, and her students have done some publications that are posted there. Here are some books you can find at your bookseller or online. The Wasp book is recent, that Bee in Your Backyard, and the Bumblebee book. They're all pretty recent, nice books. Um, but these are just some plants I grow if you want to take a photo. I, you know, there's obviously a lot more you can grow, but these are things I've had good success with, both in my yard as well as attracting pollinators. And then I, I like some shrubs because they produce uh, flowers as well and they're also often their food for some of the butterflies i'm interested in and of course the wasp might be interested in some of the larvae so it's a whole big cycle um here in wake county we use field the cottage nursery a lot the botanical garden has native plants audubon has a nice website you can search it by zip code and match up uh, plants they have a list of some nurseries around the state. I know people are from all over. You just have to look locally. A lot of nurseries now are selling native plants. Um, Prairie Ridge, uh, that's part of the Museum of Natural Sciences. And we have programs on pollinators, native plants, and we have a native plant garden you can visit. So uh, this is our study site on the left in the Uwaris where Gabrielle and I work. On the right at Prairie Ridge. And so that's I'm going to use that as a way to... Uh, say we're going to switch over to Gabrielle and um, <clears throat> so that's her photograph and um, we will have some time for some questions at the end but we're going to let her talk first before we get to um, those questions so let me back out and stop sharing there we go there we go
Thanks so much, John. All right. And I will turn it over. There's Gabrielle coming up. All right. I hope everybody can see that. I'm going to move forward. Thanks, John, for that presentation. Your photos are always so much fun to look at. And it's really cool to know that you can get all of that great diversity, even with a smaller plot. You don't have to have a lot of acres to attract all of those insects. So I'm just going to take a few minutes to talk about our recently launched citizen science project called the Southeast Bumblebee Atlas. And let's see if I can advance. There we go. So what exactly is this project, the Southeast Bumblebee Atlas? It's a region-wide community science project that's helping us to track and in turn conserve bumblebees in North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and Tennessee. So it's a regional project because of course the bumblebees don't know the state lines, but we're gonna talk today more specifically about North Carolina and things that you can do to participate in this great citizen science project. So this is actually a Xerces Society led project and the first atlas started out in the Pacific Northwest almost four years ago, maybe five years ago. And since then it's kind of grown and it's migrated east and we are the newest project here in the Southeast. You can see right here, there we are. And we just launched in May last month. So we're really excited. And this is just evidence of why this project is so important. So you can see down here, Back in 2014, there were really minimal observations. There is an app called Bumblebee Watch where you can submit observations and sometimes they pull observations from INAT, but there's never been a concentrated project that looks across a region and has really consistent observations. And so in North Carolina, we have different universities and different organizations that have done bumblebee studies, but nothing that's really integrated into one common project. And so when these Bumblebee Atlas projects started, you can see as the years went by, look at the observations. The number of observations just exploded. And so getting all that information, learning where these bees are, learning what they forage on helps us, the our land resources managers, make better management decisions about what we do on our lands, on game lands, on state parks, on wildlife refuges, so that we can keep bumblebees in mind and help their populations grow instead of declining, which is what the populations are doing right now. So if you want to participate in the Southeast Bumblebee Atlas, what can you do? Well, the first thing is that you need to go to the website, which is bumblebeeatlas.org, and watch the training video. We've had a few in-person trainings, and I don't know that we're going to have any more in-person trainings moving on this summer, but there's this really nice orientation video at that website that tells you why bumblebees are important, why we want to conserve them, and how you can get involved and the specific steps that you can take to participate. And I'm gonna talk briefly about that over the next couple of minutes, but this video is gonna give you a lot more detail. So the first thing that you wanna do is adopt a grid cell and you'll find all this information again at that website that I just showed you. And when you pull up the website and the grid cell link, it's gonna show all of the different areas across the state. So you wanna make sure to hone in on the Southeast because that's where we are. And this is what you're going to see. The state's divided into a bunch of little grid cells and each grid cell is 50 by 50 kilometers. And they are allowing, Xerces is allowing up to five areas in each grid cell to be adopted. And I don't think yet that we have any grid cells that have maxed out. I think we're getting pretty close in some of the urban areas, for instance, in Raleigh and Cary, but go check out the grid cell map and see where you would like to be involved, where you think you could go out and take photographs of bumblebees. So to get just to one more level of detail, it involves a field work aspect of it. So if you sign up to participate in the Bumblebee Atlas, you are committing to surveying at least twice in the grid cell of your choice. And so you can do it with a friend. And so I say two 45 person minute surveys. If you go out with a friend, then that means that the two of you collectively have to survey for 45 minutes. So then you would survey 22 minutes and your friend would survey 23 minutes and you can add that together and you have one survey that is completed. And what you wanna do while you're out there is you wanna net bumblebees. So you see here in this picture, we have this net and we can give you information on where you can order these nets from. And basically you just go up to a flower and you try to net the bumblebee off of the flower and you wanna transfer it into a vial. And over here on the right, you can see what the vials look like. 
And on this training video that I've sent you the link for, that I've given you the link for, it has all of the tips and techniques on how to net the bee, how to put the bee in a vial, and how to put the vial into the cooler. So it's not, you know, you might be overwhelmed thinking, oh, I don't know how to net the bee or do any of this. We have lots of great resources on the website to show you step-by-step -step how to do this. So once you have the bee in the vial, you're gonna put the bee in this cooler of ice, like you see right here. And you might ask, why would I be doing that? Well, the ice is essentially going to slow that bee down. Think of it as anesthetizing the bee. So no harm is done to the bee, but you can handle the bee without fear of getting stung. And remember what John said, only female bees sting. So if you have a male bee, you wouldn't have to worry about that anyway. But the reason that we want to slow these bees down is so that we can take their pictures. John alluded to this before. Most bees, you can't identify them down to a species unless you have them dead under a microscope. So it can be really frustrating, a little bittersweet to have to catch and kill these things that we love so much just to be able to identify them. But the great thing about this Atlas project is that it's all non-lethal collection. So if you catch the bee, you put it in the vial, you put the vial on the ice, you anesthetize it, and then you're able to handle the bees while they're essentially frozen, while they're still, and you can take pictures of their head, which gives us identifiable features and then you can take pictures of their abdomen and pictures of their thorax. And so with bumblebees, we look here because there are sometimes characteristics on their abdomen that shows what species they are, sometimes here on their thorax and then on their head, on their face. We also look for certain things that help us determine what kind of bee that is. So you can see here, Lori, she's our Xerces project coordinator in the Southeast. She's taking pictures of her anesthetized bee. Once she's done with that bee, we just set the bee down on a warm surface and let the bee warm up. Usually takes maybe five or 10 minutes. And then the bee flies off on her way and everything is back to normal. So this is the data sheet that you would use if you wanna participate. And here on the left, this gives a little bit of information about the habitat that you're in. Because like I said, the best way for us to effectively conserve bumblebees is to learn more about their foraging preferences, where they like to live, what kind of flowers they like to feed on. So this information here on the left will tell us. And then this data sheet on the right is where you enter in your bee information. So you see here, there's a slot for bumblebee species. If you know the species, then great, you can enter it, but you don't have to know the species of bee. You have to number the photograph of that bee and you upload that and we'll have expert verification on the other end. And when I say upload it, you upload it to that app I mentioned before called Bumblebee Watch. And then they'll be able to verify or they'll be able to determine what type of bee that is based on those pictures that you've taken of the head, of the thorax and of the abdomen. And so I think initially it might be a little bit daunting, but once you get down to it and you start netting the bees and take the pictures, you're going to see that it's not too hard, hopefully, um, and it's going to give us so much information. Remember that chart I showed you a couple slides ago where the number of observations just exploded and helps us figure out what we can do to conserve these bumblebees so that we can protect them. So this is the app. This is the website. You can do either app on your phone or you can go to the website. This is where you will upload that data sheet and all of the observations. And there'll be expert verification on the other end to determine what those species are. So in a nutshell, that is the Atlas. This is my contact information because if you have questions, I am more than happy to help you. I'm happy to give you tips or assistance or troubleshoot anything that you might um, not understand. But again, we'd love to have your participation. It's so important to have folks out on the ground helping us look for these bumblebees and helping us figure out what we can do to conserve them because we do know that populations are declining. So we're excited to launch this project. It's gonna take place this year. 2024 and 2025, and we're hoping just to get a lot of data. And I will say we've already gotten a lot of participation in the Piedmont, but we have less participation in the mountains and the coastal plain of North Carolina. So I really encourage you to check out the website and think a little bit more about participating. And please reach out to me if you have any questions, because I'd love to chat with you about it. And that's all I got. Fantastic stuff. Thank you, Gabriella. 
I'm uh that's a cool project. I hadn't heard about that yet. And that's really exciting, especially to see the explosion in observations that you showed us. That's cool because data is cool. Having data uh, is meaningful. Uh, but also more observations means more people getting outside and enjoying and experiencing nature, kind of like John shared with us, like the beauty and joy of getting out there and seeing and photographing and getting to know really the incredible diversity of wildlife that we have in our state and our region. So that's cool stuff. Viewers, let me remind you, if you've got questions for John and Gabriella, drop them in the chat. I'm going to be coming to you in just a moment for questions that you may have about the bees and wasps in North Carolina and what's going on to protect them. And maybe to kick things off a little bit, I am kind of interested in what bee and wasp conservation looks like. Because like, I, I feel like we saw two different versions of it between the two presentations. Like John's got a little patch of native plants and the bees and wasps love it. And he's seeing really incredible diversity, even in a, like a suburban urban interface. But we also hear about how some of these species are rare or maybe declining. And so what does an organization like NC Wildlife Resources do to protect and conserve tiny little things like bees and wasps? So I think when you're thinking about bees and wasps, the most important thing to consider is habitat. We're facing such a huge decline because they're losing habitat and they can't fly very far. So as our habitat is becoming fragmented, they're being confined to these little areas. So John's patch in his yard is perfect, but would make what would make it even more perfect is if his neighbor had a patch and his neighbor had a patch so that they have connectivity because insects need forage, they need shelter, they need places to breed, but they also need space and they need an ability to move, to look for mates, to migrate. So it's really important creating habitat. So when we work with landowners, that's what it's all about. What can you do to get this appropriate type of habitat on the ground? All of these native plants like John has the appropriate breeding habitat. So for bees and wasps, that's leaving bare ground because if you have lawn, they can't work. They can't chew through the lawn. They need bare ground. They need soil that they can dig through. So it's all about having the right characteristics to support them so that they'll want to come to your backyard, to your property. And Chris, I'll add that, um, so there are different groups that work with the public. So the museum, for example, the Audubon chapters, there are there are other chapters of other conservation groups, like land conservancies, land trusts that, that Gabrielle and I both work with, but they have their own members. And we, we, we do programming and consulting to get people to do more of what I'm doing, to get a mix of plants in their yard. And you don't have to get rid of all your other like non-native we don't really i don't tell people that i just say add in add in the native plants into the mix just start adding things in <clears throat> and people are more receptive to that idea anyway and then uh you know working to put that list together uh that actually started years ago with nc state university um to, to do the native plant list for for butterflies and for birds and then we took it to the next level through audubon and uh so that's a different scale. That's the yard scale. Like like Gabrielle said, I'm actually part of a neighborhood group and we're trying to get different neighbors to do that connectivity where we have several neighbors together doing their gardening that way, but also small landowners. So we're, uh, Gabrielle and I are working on some videos for small landowners to promote. Uh, it may be you only have five or 10 acres. You can still do a lot. That's a lot to a group of bees. And so different scales and different groups are doing different kinds of uh, again, education and consulting to get different landowners to go out and do to do these, uh, as she said, to create different kinds of habitats, micro habitats for the for the arthropods, for the, in this case the bees and wasps. Um, and then hopefully it will all add up. You know, we will add up in the aggregate. So. I think right. a piece of it too is um, I was just gonna say too to embrace insects, because I think a lot of people have very negative misconceptions. They're going to sting me. They're going to harm me. Most of our native bees are solitary. They don't have that tendency like a yellow jacket where they need to protect anything because they're solitary. So, you know, as many insects as I've run around chasing and taking pictures of, I very, very rarely get stung. 
And insects are the base, they're the base component of our food chain. So without insects, you know, even if you don't like insects, but you love birds, you have to have insects to support birds. You have to have insects to support a lot of other species. So trying to welcome those insects and not be so fearful is a pretty big part of the outreach that we do as well. Uh, that was precisely what I was going to ask about uh, is how you feel projects like these or presentations like these or work like this uh, gets people to not be so afraid of the bees and wasps that they see in their yards or to to plant and uh, you hit it perfectly. I think. I think I know, it's, it's uh, always, well, it's, it's just really like with John, when you show all those pictures and I love to show pictures too, and people realize how beautiful these insects are and the really intricate detailed way that they forage or where they nest or how they fly or it's i think it always opens people's eyes to realize wow these insects are pretty interesting you know they're not just there to sting me they have a really neat lifestyle and that makes a difference i think it makes a huge difference so a uh, question from the chat for you can you give us any insights on bee hotels well, it is controversial. I will just tell you that. Um, and that is because uh, similar to the paper wasp issue, you're artificially inflating some of the numbers. Often the bees, we have a number of orchard bees that are not natives. So uh, people, you know, people, we like the orchard bees, for example. I'm talking about the um, uh, mason, mason bee. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the different mason bees, there's a number of mason bees that are not native, but they're used in agriculture. But um, but when you when you have the bee hotels, um, it can sometimes cause an imbalance in your yard, for example, in your area. So it's an imbalance to the native bee. Also, it can actually cause a disease outbreak. People have documented the spread of a disease. It's causing a it's communal it's a communal spread. There are these little mites, little bacteria. There are all these little things out there. That, the same thing that affects us affects animals all the way down to uh, insects. They get they get sick as well. And so people have shown that, that these bee hotels can be a real, uh, a, 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 what do you call it, a spreader, a big spreader. So anyway, and Gabrielle, you probably have some comments on it too. Yep, I, I think bee hotels, you're right, John, are very controversial. They also, in addition to disease, they also attract a lot of predators, right? And they're natural um, predators. Maybe circle of life, but nonetheless, you know, when you have this concentrated area of activity, it's certainly going to draw the attention of something that wants to predate or parasitize it. So, what we always tell people is that if you want to have a bee hotel, because it is something that's really fun to watch, you just have to make sure to keep it clean. Just like if you have a bird feeder, you want to try to keep it clean because there's so many things that use it. But also consider creating the natural habitat that those bees would regularly use in the absence of a bee hotel. So those are all cavity nesting bees. So when you are doing fall work, instead of cutting back all of your stems, all of your dead stems to the ground, leave standing stems so that the bees can use those stems. If you have hollow or pithy stems, those are really good places for them to nest. If you have trees or logs that have fallen onto your property, Bees really like to nest. They go behind beetles that make, have you ever heard the expression, boring beetles make for interesting bees? Bees will use the, the tunnels that beetles will bore out in dead and rotting logs. So there are a lot of different ways you can create that natural habitat on your landscape without adding the bee hotel. Yeah. I guess and if I had a bee hotel, I might just do like a few uh, tunnels, not uh, some of those hotels, you know, they can host up to 50 individuals. And I would say maybe just do five, you know, there's no need that it has to be big. More isn't always better. Bigger isn't always better. So, you know, you could have maybe five tunnels instead of 50. You know. Excellent stuff. Another one for you. How often do you get bee pictures submitted to your atlas that are mimics that aren't actually bees or wasps? Uh, and is that an issue? No. So so we're just starting out with the Atlas. So we haven't had a ton of submissions yet, but that wouldn't be an issue because the point is to get everybody outside and to get people interested and to get people noticing these things. So if we get a few mimic pictures along the way, it's really not that big of a deal because it's easy enough for us just to put that picture to the side, say, oh, that's just a flyer. That's a wasp. 
but in the training videos that we do and the in-person trainings, we talk in a lot of detail about what a bumblebee looks like. And we do actually have a segment that teaches people how to distinguish between a wasp, a fly, and a bumblebee. And as you look at more of them and you look for those identifiable features to distinguish the flies, the wasps, and the bumblebees, it's going to become second nature. And so I think the further you get into the project, the easier it's going to be for you to determine that that's a bumblebee and not a wasp. And plus bumblebees, they are really kind of big and fluffy. Somebody likes calling them flying teddy bears. And so they are, they can be pretty distinctly noticeable as opposed to other things, but that should never deter you from joining the Atlas. If you submit something that's not a bumblebee, that is no problem. Yeah, it's more, more information for us. Yeah. Data, data is good. Yeah. Yep. One thing, one thing I do uh, sometimes is, um, I have something, I'm in the field, for example, I have a photo on my camera or somebody shows me one on their phone. I'll just use my app, Seek app, which is part of, which is actually a subsidiary of, of iNaturalist. It's a stripped down version of iNaturalist and it's meant to be for kids because it doesn't track your location. So, but it's great at, it's pretty good at identifying things. Sometimes I'll just point my, so I, you point your uh, phone camera at the picture and um, so, so sometimes I can tell what something is ahead of time before I go and upload it, to, for example, to my iNaturalist account. If I'm really wanting to know what something is right away, I just just do it right there. Right. You know, I'm, I'm pointing at somebody else's camera screen, right. but it's but the resolution's right. good enough that for the app to actually tell me what it is. So, yeah, you can even do you could do that if you were doing B Atlas stuff. You could you know, look ahead of time using Seek or iNaturalist. Interesting stuff. Uh, someone else in the chat wanted to know if they could get access to this your slideshow, John, because I think they want to, I don't know, maybe they'll print it off and just take it out in the field. It's fine with me. Yeah. I would say, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm fine with people using it. I'm not trying to make money off <laughs> taking photos. And um, I don't even put my name on, on, you know, most of those. I put my, I put name on, you know, like Gabrielle or Missy, but, um, uh, I'm fine. The, I think the best thing to do, I'm at the, you know, I'm at the Museum of Natural Sciences, so you can find my email on the, on the museum's uh, website, or if you want to type it in and just email me, probably the best thing to do is I would, I will, I have a copy of it online in my Google Drive, and I just send you the link because it's, it's, you know, almost 90 megabytes. So. Right. It's not something to email, but I can send you the link and then you can download it and, or turn it into a PDF, you know, yeah. Excellent stuff. And then uh, another question came in that's pretty interesting. When we have poor air quality due to fires like we have today, does this has a, ne uh, a negative effect on the bees? Well, that's a really interesting question because when we, so one of our main management tools on state owned lands is prescribed fire. It's a really good habitat management tool. And when we're in the middle of a prescribed burn, you often note that the insect activity does diminish. And that's understandable because you have a lot of smoke in the air. But when you do a prescribed burn, it rolls through pretty quickly. And so you might have a loss of an hour or two of activity, maybe less. And then the insect activity rises again. So on a day like today, though, where it's a lot more sustained, that's a great question to know. I'm sure that it impacts insect activity to some extent. But to what extent? I don't know, because it, like I said, it's so sustained. I know that when we burn, like I said, it does diminish, but it's such a brief amount of time that I think the insects can afford to to hunker down for a little bit. Yeah, I don't know if there, I don't know if anybody's done any research on, uh, say, the air quality, you know, the, 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 the way a, an insect breathes, a little mm -hmm. different from us. So I don't know how much that would affect it. And then there's the vision part. And I don't, because of the way Hymenoptera see, especially bees and wasps flying around, and they have a, you know, their the way their eyes work is different. So the way they can use polarized light and other things. So, uh, you know, when there's, when there's smoke like that, it's going to be affecting how the light rays are coming. I, I don't know. I don't know if anybody's done any, any research on how I'm sure it, like it, like Gabriella said, there's an effect. I don't know what it is, but um, yeah, it's an interesting question. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, and I, uh, 
I, I, I breezed right past in the books there, but um, a really interesting book is one that came out 40 years ago called Bumblebee Economics. And um, that, that fellow was doing his PhD work on bumblebees. And then he figured out how their, how their lymph fluid flows. People hadn't quite solved this riddle back in the 1970s. And, um, but he's figured out a lot of other things and pulled together a lot of interesting information. And the idea behind bumblebee economics is like, what's the currency of a bumblebee? And it's sugar. Um, so I hope when I'm reincarnated in my next life, I'm a bumblebee because I sure do eat a lot of cookies and brownies <laughs> and ice cream. So yeah, <laughs> so I'm a bumblebee now. Um, so anyway, he points out how, uh, you know, those calories coming from energy coming from sugar, he's calculating it down to the little, you know, micro joules of what they need, um, to to sustain on a daily basis he did a bunch of calculations like that so that's what his economics is referring to the math behind what does it take to live all summer long like how much do you need how much nectar and pollen do you need if you're a bee and so it's kind of interesting and so a, a, a day like today might have a negative impact enough that the bee couldn't get the resources it needs i just don't know but that's you know that's what comes to mind is it's like maybe they can't see very well and they can't navigate and uh, or maybe the air quality slows down their physiology for flight and they can't get to the nectar which they need so, yeah it's an interesting question but check out that book if he had an update to it sometime i think in the 90s it did an update bumblebee economics Bernd heinrich all right it sounds great well uh we'll leave it there John, Gabriella, thanks for being on the program today. Really appreciate your time and expertise. Thanks for having Glad us. To be. Yeah, thanks for having us. Good to be here. Thanks, awesome. everyone, for coming out. Oh, my gosh, it's good to be here. Okay. <laughs> 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 thanks, y'all, and thanks, everybody, for tuning in today. We will be back here next Wednesday again at noon with another presentation. We're going to be hearing from folks over at the Division of Marine Fisheries. So go ahead and mark your calendars. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. Sign up for the Office of Environmental Education's Lunchtime Discovery Series email newsletter. That way you can get the link in your inbox. You can get updates and details at naturalsciences.org or check out their website, eenorthcarolina.org. Both are great resources for you. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Uh, go take some pictures of some bees and wasps, and we'll see you again next week. Bye, folks. <laughs>